Wow, that's a beautiful song. I can't keep from crying. Good morning, church. <laughs> I've been a crier all my life, but I'm getting worse now that I'm getting weak and old. <laughs> The picture we have here comes from the ancient city of Corinth, which of course is one of the churches mentioned in the Bible. Paul writes a letter to them that we call 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians as well. And does anybody know where the controller is? It's missing. <laughs> you want me to move me to the next slide? There you go. This morning I want to talk about being around the table, of course, the table of the Lord. And uh, as we move to the next slide. I want to tell you. if I can, about a table that means a lot to me, okay? When my grandfather passed away, and I've told y'all all this before, but I'm going to tell you again, moved in with my aunt and uncle. My grandfather was a great influence on my life, and so were my aunt and uncle. And, uh, my uncle believed that Christians should take care of orphans. He believed that individual Christians should take care of widows. And he put his money and his life where his mouth was. My aunt and uncle cared for foster children. Jerry grew up to be one of the top fire chiefs in Indianapolis. Clifton grew up to have his own business in Indianapolis. They were foster kids. And my aunt and uncle had other foster kids they cared for before I ever came along. And here are some names. My aunt and uncle at the top, and then it has all my cousins and some of those foster kids. Cindy Connie. Keith and Kent were their own physical children. Tina was an adopted infant that they <coughs> took, whose mother was uh, buried in drugs. Clifton's mother had 16 children in Indianapolis, and she didn't know who the fathers were. That's the life Clifton came from. Marcia and Donna, those are my sisters. And myself, we were wards of the state of Indiana. We were orphans <laughs> of the state of Indiana. Carla was another foster child whose life was tremendously blessed because of my aunt and uncle, even though she was mentally handicapped. She grew up to have a wonderful husband. How about that? Isn't that something? And her parent, of course, was from a drug background, too. So we all sat around this big table in the kitchen, and I've told you about that table, right? My uncle sat on the stove side of it, his back against the stove. I sat on the door going out to the washroom. <laughs> We completely filled that room with that table and all of us. <laughs> and those were fantastic times. 
You know, we were farm people, so we ate meals together. We had breakfast together, and my uncle cooked the breakfast, even though he had gone out and fed the hogs <laughs> in the early morning and put the sows out so the, they could have some freedom from their baby pigs for a while. And then he'd come in and cook our breakfast. And we'd have lunch together. We'd sit around the table and have lunch, and we'd sit around that table and have supper. And when we went to school, we'd come home and we'd sit around that table and eat. We would laugh. <laughs> we would all tell what happened at school that day. We'd talk about the good things, the bad things. Sometimes we'd get reprimanded, but most usually we're so encouraged. It was such an encouraging time to be around the table. And I would laugh sometimes so bad I'd have to stand up and run into the other room crying for laughter. Have you enjoyed times like that? And as we move to the next slide, I take us back to Corinth. There is the remains of the Temple of Apollo, and of course, uh, up on the mountain there, they also had temple places where they engaged in immorality, and they worshiped their pagan gods. And when the Corinthians became Christians, they had to flee all that. Paul tells them to flee idolatry in 1 Corinthians. He tells them to flee fornication that was connected with the idolatry, by the way. He tells them to run away from it and come to Jesus Christ and do his will. As we see in the next slide, Paul talks about getting away from the idolatry and being the Christian God expected them to be. He said, is not this cup of blessing, he's talking about the Lord's Supper, right? Is not this cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? The King James, instead of using the word sharing, it uses the word communing. Communion. Have you ever heard that term? Lord's Supper called communion? It comes from this verse right here. But the word communion is, 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 a, is a word that means to share in. You're sharing in this. We're all here sitting around the table of the Lord right now, and we're going to share in something, right? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. There's something about the Lord's Supper that kind of makes us one, doesn't it? It brings us all together. It's just like us sitting at the ward table in the farmhouse. We're all brought together as a family there, and we're sitting around the table, and we're sharing this moment together. He said, look at the nation of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices shares in the altar? What do I mean then? What am I talking about? What am I trying to say, Paul says? He's saying that, that when, you, when you eat those sacrifices, you're sharing in, the, sharing in the altar, sharing in what's going on there. When you eat the Lord's Supper, we're sharing in the body and blood of Christ, aren't we, in our thoughts? We're sharing in that. Okay, so that what do I mean then? That's what Paul wants, wants us to realize. That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. The sacrifices to idols are nothing. The idols themselves are nothing. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, that is, there on the hillside in Corinth, in the temple of Apollo or the temple of Athena, the things that they, the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become shares in, the, in demons. What's he saying? I don't want you to have anything to do with the idolatry. <laughs> because when you engage in those activities, 
you are joining yourself to the idolatry. You're joining yourself to the immorality that's taking place there. He says to him in verse 21, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You, not, you cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. And, of course, his point is he's trying to bring them out of idolatry, which they were so steep in, which they were so used to. As we'll see in the next slide, did you know that at all these temples, they offered sacrifices. What'd they do with all that meat? Well, they would have places in the marketplace where they would sell it, but guess what? They also had restaurants at their temples. Yeah, these are all invitations to the temples for parties to eat at the restaurant at the temple. This. Look at this. These are from ancient papyri dug up in Egypt. And they're invitations, just invitations. He says, this individual request your company at the table of Lord Serapis. Serapis was a pagan god. At, the, at, the, at his temple tomorrow at 9 o'clock. <laughs> There's an invitation to the restaurant. Another Invites a friend to eat a meal at the temple of Serapis to celebrate the, the first birthday of a daughter. They're going to have a birthday party, and guess where it's going to be? At the pagan temple. And when they ate those meats, those meats had been offered to this pagan god, and, they, and so when they, when they have the party, they're associating themselves with this pagan god. Okay? And so Paul says to the Corinthians, don't be going to those temples to do this anymore. You separate yourself from that, okay? You're to be around not the table of demons, as he calls it, but the table of the Lord. In the next slide, we want to see that we are at the table of the Lord. It is a table of fellowship. It's a table of remembrance. It's a table holding the things that we partake of, the bread and the fruit of the vine. Next slide. I've shown you this picture several times because I think it's so fascinating. It's just fascinating. Somewhere in northern Israel, near the site of Megiddo, famous city in the Old Testament. In Roman times, there was a military camp there. And they, they had their barracks and they had other buildings. And there was a bread shop there. In the back end of the bread shop, there was a place where Christians met. Okay, and this, this is the floor of that place where Christians met. You see those fish up there? Why are there fish in a meeting house of Christians? Fishers of men. They use the word ichthus to, to spell out who Jesus is. Lord, Savior, I can't think of it right now, but Mark can probably tell us. <laughs> ichthus. So that was a symbol of Christians. And it, it, have you ever seen it on somebody's car? Seen an ichthus on somebody's car? They're trying to tell you, hey, I'm a Christian. Yeah, you've seen it. Well, this, this is where Christians met. And right in the middle of that, that and, and this was a back room in this place. It was a back room in this, in this bakery that was feeding soldiers, Roman soldiers. And they had a place of worship there, and the date on this is about 230 B.C. And in some of this writing, they actually called Jesus God. So the Da Vinci Code that says that Constantine made Jesus God is wrong. <laughs> in fact, Pliny says Christians called Jesus God in 112 A.D., Pliny the Younger, governor of Bithynia. Okay? 
But I just think this, it, this is so neat because you know what was in the middle there? And right in the middle, on top of those stones that are set there, you know what that was? That was that thing right there, the Lord's table. <laughs> These Christians gathered around the Lord's table to remember the God Jesus who died for our sins. Isn't this so cool? And in, in, in the later third century, in the 200s, Diocletian, who killed Christians, he was a Roman emperor, killed Christians. In this area in particular, he killed Christians. This, this church building was covered with dirt because he, he, caught, he destroyed all the meeting places of Christians, Diocletian did. And he destroyed their scriptures if he could ever find them. He had them eradicated. He wanted to eradicate Christians from the Roman Empire. And they buried this church building in dirt so that archaeologists could dig it up later and show us what Christians believe. Isn't that so cool? I think that's so exciting. You guys just don't get as exciting as I do. Next slide. There is a word that's underlined right there. Do you see a Greek word that's underlined? Next slide. There you see it a little more clearly. And it's a Greek word, trapeza. And guess what it spells? Table. And it's the exact same word Paul used in our text I read a few minutes ago. Exact same word. And it's talking about the person who, who paid to, to have this table available to these Christians. That's why it's in this mosaic on the floor. Isn't that so cool? So we go to the last slide and I'm done. Being around the table... We share in this time of giving thanks to the God. That's why it's called the Eucharist. Eucharist tao is a Greek verb for giving thanks. We're giving praise to God. As that beautiful psalm that we sang did. Can't you just feel it? Can't you feel that moment of praise? We're giving honor to the one who was despised and rejected. We're giving glory to him who was raised from the dead and exalted on high. And we're eating and drinking in the remembrance of Jesus. Thank you.